also uh, we will post our so this seminar to our uh, YouTube uh, channel. Um, but uh, well, I hope you all agree. And so, um, as you know, Nicolai, you, we have around 45, 50 minutes for presentations. Perhaps uh, there will be some question during the seminar just uh, for clarification. And then at the end, we will have uh, additional, uh, let's say, questions for discussion. Okay, I will, uh, I, I would like to ask you to switch your mic off just to uh, avoid uh, uh, noise. Okay, I will also switch uh, my, my camera off, but I will be here. Okay, see you and, uh, and uh, uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and also for the opportunity to present our recent work in this seminar here. Uh, as you mentioned, this is joint work uh, with Inyaki, who also worked uh, extensively on health inequalities, among other things. Um, this, this paper here is um, research in progress, so all comments, questions and suggestions are always highly welcome. Um, if you're interested, there is also a, a working paper available. Um, uh, it's in the Akinex series. Uh, you can also just write me and I would share it. Um, and actually, this, this work here is not about poverty, but human development. So the broader theme of uh, well-being measurement and analysis uh, is still there. Um, but we, what we do in this, in this paper here is um, we actually propose new measures and we call it under and over performance measures and explore um, a new, relatively new data set uh, of the human development index. In the end, I think it's, so it's a measurement approach. In the end, the idea is um, very simple, um, but I think we, or we believe that this is, that this is actually quite useful um, in practice for policy purposes and to enrich the analysis on related um, matters. So this is the outline uh, of the talk, um, which is straightforward. Um, um, yeah, I will let me let me give you first a brief motivation um, of this paper. So we already know quite what is quite well documented is that living conditions have been increasing around the world. And what we mean with living conditions here is the different dimensions of human well-being, in particular the health, health dimension, which is often measured by life expectancy or child mortality, but also education, for example, which is usually measured as school enrollment, literacy rates, or school attendance. Um, so this is well documented. There's lots of research on that. And uh, in case you, probably you are aware, but in case you're not, our world and data is a very nice source, which brings the different big themes together and which help to document the general uh, patterns that we observe. However, this is largely confined to uh, analysis on what happens on average. It's much less clear what actually happens uh, with inequality, and that includes spatial inequalities, which is what we are focusing on. Uh, and this is interesting in the sense that uh, the importance of spatial inequalities is actually widely recognized and um, partly, for example, because it often comes together with greater interpersonal inequality. Uh, so on the deeper level, if you want, um, but then it's also documented and there is, there is quite a bit of research on that, uh, which actually documents that also political and ethnic tensions uh, are associated with uh, inequalities in income, but also other uh, outcomes. And it is interesting to note also that it's not only on the research side, but also in the policy side that regional um, cohesion or regional convergence, there are different themes, that, that, that this is actually uh, acknowledged in various strategies, including uh, the EU uh, 2020 strategy, but also the sustainable development goals, which explicitly focus on subnational inequalities and uh, when, uh, to, uh, to reduce them. Now, um, why is there, why are the, what are the constraints? Uh, why do we know relatively little about territorial cohesion? Um, well, of course, there are, on the one hand, there are data limitations. There is, a, there is a good amount of research that studies within country inequality on the subnational level. But the usual problem there is that this kind of analysis is a constraint to, well, a dozen or maybe 20 countries. Uh, so it's often for OECD countries or EU countries, and then for a handful of developing countries. Um, so it's not really a comprehensive analysis that is available. Uh, and as a side, as a side well, on, on the term cohesion, we use it for now just to avoid, because we, we aim to complement the usual terms in term, uh, uh, like inequality or convergence. So we, we want to adopt a somewhat wider notion here. 
And so this is uh, one of the constraints, but we argue also, and this is where we aim to contribute, um, that actually the methods that are used usually to study convergence and inequality have, a kind, have kind of a blind spot. And the argument here is uh, we cannot really capture regions which are left behind. So we can well observe uh, uh, decreasing, so improvements on average, decreasing inequality, and the, at the same time, regions which don't, don't catch up uh, or which are left behind. And that is actually problematic if, you, if we take the credo or the, the motto of the SDGs, which is often it's quoted from the preamble, to leave no one behind. And this includes no region behind. But we can, so this is the policy motivation uh, that this matters. But there is also a, social, uh, a welfare economic view uh, in the strong version advocated by Rawls and in a weaker version uh, to ad, uh, advocated by Zen, that the, the outcome of the worst off might matter at least, or in Rawls' case, should be the only thing to focus on. So there, there is a good reason to actually see what actually happens in the tails of the distribution, rather only whether to study whether the distributions are shifting or get, uh, uh, getting more squeezed. So what we're doing in this paper here is we, on the one hand, we propose uh, new measures, which we call over and under development measures. It's simple in the sense that these measures are technically well understood because effectively they are poverty and richness measures, which have been uh, analyzed in the axiomatic literature on uh, poverty and richness measurement. And then we also offer, uh, I think, an interesting empirical analysis, which builds on or draws on new uh, data set, which has been um, put together by Jeroen Smits from the Global, Global Data Lab and Iñaki Permanier um, from the Center for Dem Demographic Studies. And in this data set, which is freely available, um, in this data set we rely or we study 160, uh, some 160 countries, which with approximately uh, 1,600 subnational regions. The interesting thing is also, uh, I mean, of course, there are limitations. Um, one is we don't have fully, we don't have a fully balanced uh, panel, but some countries we have data from the 90s already, and some only join later. But in principle, I think it's a rich source to study uh, um, uh, human development uh, index developments on the subnational level. So to give you a brief preview, what we what we seek to document in the analysis. Uh, on the one hand, we start off with levels and trends of inequality in human development. That is in particular to connect with previous research. So to, uh, because that is kind of um, where, where, where previous research uh, stopped. Uh, and what we seek to extend or where we want to explore whether our measures can add something uh, in terms of new insights. And then we also explore levels and trends of over and under development. And in order to better understand, because there is a technical link between the measures, uh, there are many ways how to explore this relationship between over and under performance and measures and inequality measures. And one of them is to study the contributions of over and under developing regions to inequality, which builds on the decompositional properties of the inequality measures. And, and, and an important uh, thing to realize is we actually have two more or less independent exercises, uh, which we both show. I think both are interesting on, the, on their own. Um, and they are kind of connected, um, but that's um, not the key insight here. But on the one hand, we um, focus on within country inequalities, but that around the globe. And in the other exercise, we focus on global inequality. So, and the measures are applied in different ways. So this is in order to, to, to illustrate the usefulness of the measures and see to which extent they can enrich the perspective of only inequality uh, or inequality only. Uh, sorry, then um, I see, uh, um, uh, to give you, I mean, we have many results. Uh, just to give you a small preview, um, I selected three of them. In a general trend is that we see that over and under performance by tendency is also disappearing over time. And that holds for the global uh, analysis, global inequality analysis and the within inequality analysis. We also see that actually over performance measures can contribute substantially to the amount of inequality that we observe. But what is a bit worrisome is also the, one of the results is that despite observing declining inequality, not pretty much everywhere, but to a large extent, we, we find, uh, depending on the parameter choice, 11 to 25 regions, which are lagging behind in the sense that there is no progress anymore compared to global uh, uh, performance. And that for the last 10 years. And that is a bit more worrisome. Um, 
but these are, these are a selection of our results. I will return to them in detail. To give you a quick sense, in case uh, you are not familiar with uh, the entire literature, um, just to some, some quick points uh, on that. On the one hand, the HDI, I mean, there are many various limitations have been recognized. Uh, one of them is that inequality is actually neglected. Um, there have been attempts to include inequality directly into the measure of the MPI. That's one approach explored by some papers. A different uh, uh, approach is to construct uh, um, HDIs that even down to the individual level in order to capture inequality. Uh, and sometimes, similar in our work, we actually study inequality in terms of the HDI. And, and there we are following some, some previous research. Um, the, the, the other thing is where we actually um, add to the literature is that we offer an analysis for 160 countries uh, of subnational inequality. For now, most of these studies were limited to a, a dozen or, or 20 countries. Um, uh, and, uh, and we have different well-being measures here. No? It's like uh, not only HDI, but uh, I mean, uh, dimensions of well-being received recently more and more attention. Um, we also argue that we should uh, complement, or it, makes, it may make sense to complement, uh, the conventional methods, uh, in particular of convergence and inequality. I mean, maybe you're aware there was the beta convergence, the sigma convergence, and then because it's, uh, I mean, sigma is already quite uh, uh, a useful measure, but then we know from inequality measures um, that they have actually better and, and desirable properties. So there was a trend to study inequality or to use inequality measures, which are well understood from an axiomatic point of view, more systematically. But we argue that there is a gap, uh, that there is a blind spot that we seek to close with our measures. And a brief background on the, um, on the evidence on convergence or inequality in terms of the dimensions of human well-being. On the one hand, by tendency, we observe decreasing inequality of uh, education. We also observe decreasing inequality in many of the health outcomes. It's less clear uh, what is happening to income inequality. Um, there is research, well, the evidence is mixed here. Uh, finally, there is uh, also of uh, Inyaki and Jeroen, there is one paper that is already documenting recently the first line of how inequality, uh, inequality among other things, uh, seems to emerge from, from this new database. So how do we proceed with the methods? Um, so we essentially apply the same methodological apparatus to both sets of analysis, but I will cover so the country level and the global level, but I will cover the country level in more detail because the other one is very similar. So uh, we, we have countries uh, with, with, which, com which comprise or consist of our regions. Um, and then we have an achievement vector, which is uh, the X. In our case, it's the HDI. And it's also important that we account for population shares of the different regions. And then our inequality measure is straightforward. It's, there are many ways of how to write the Gini coefficients. What we do here is uh, we follow this formulation, which has later advantages for the decomposition. And uh, we, 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 uh, an important uh, quantity here is the mu, which is the national mean. So we formulate the Gini in terms of the national mean. Um, which is useful to connect with our uh, over and under performance measures. So, and how do we, how, uh, how do we uh, construct them? Well, as I said, essentially it's the class of poverty measures and we, we, but we apply these measures not to households or individuals, but effectively to subnational regions. Um, and um, so the key thing here is that we have obviously a poverty cutoff, which is the, un, uh, uh, the Z, and here the Z is defined as a proportion of the national mean. So effectively, we are using uh, a purely relative poverty measure, uh, which is tied to the, to the mean, but the mean itself is growing over time or changing over time. So that's uh, an interesting feature here. And then we have the entire class or family uh, of uh, poverty measures. So and th these are described by the choice of the alpha, which can be either for if alpha is zero, it's the simple headcount ratio, if you want. So that will be the proportion of people living in an area which is lagging behind. But then we also can, uh, for other, other choices, like one and two for the alpha, we get the usual gaps or squared gaps, which for which we, uh, which can be used to better trace progress, uh, how far people are away from the poverty line. Um, and then we have also in this underdevelopment measure, we have uh, here the, the population share, which is 
Um, an important aspect from a well-being perspective, because we want, if, if we have an individual or person-centered approach, we want not only to know whether the region is lagging behind, but also how many people are living there. And that is uh, reflected by incorporating population shares uh, here. Uh, and in principle, um, yeah, so later, later the, one of the questions will be to choose the A, so which proportion is appropriate. It will be something between zero and one. Uh, because we are interested in an underperformance or underdevelopment measures. I will use these terms synonymously. And the overdevelopment measure is constructed in a similar way, just that we are now interest, interested in how far away or whether a particular region is relatively far away above the, the, the mean of the national country. But we get an entire set uh, for the entire family of measures. And here, the key thing will be to choose uh, the beta um, uh, for the empirical exercise. Maybe I, I should also mention that we are currently only covering the Gini, which, but we actually did analysis for other measures as well, mean log uh, deviation, for instance, but we finally removed them because um, they were just adding many, much more evidence, but little, little insight. Um, but this is, and that we prefer the Gini because of the decompositional features, which you will see in a bit here. So um, the one, one, I mean, there are many ways how to decompose the Gini. And we chose this particular notation here uh, because it's uh, very easy to decompose it and actually calculate the contribution of an individual I to the overall inequality. This, this is discussed in the, in the first paper uh, um, cited here, and there are, uh, th this can be traced back to the formulation of Kenner and Stewart. Um, the, uh, in our case, this would be the contribution of one particular region to the, to the inequality that we observe in, a, in, in one particular country. Um, and then one step forward, or the next step would be, we, we, because we have uh, our measure of under and over performance, this allows us to identify in the first place the regions who are underperforming and overperforming. And then we, we can simply calcul uh, calculate the contribution of one particular, no, sorry, uh, the, the contribution of under of all underperforming units taking population shares into account relative uh, the contribution to the entire uh, to the inequality observed in that country at that point of time and the same works obviously for the overperformance again uh, as well um, if we move to the global level analysis many things remain the same but we have to uh, take a slightly different focus in the sense that we have to account for the population shares of a region I in country C with respect to the world population, because that is what now matters. Um, and we also have to introduce the, the outcomes uh, correspondingly of the uh, Subnational Human Development Index. And the big change here is instead of the, so the big difference between the two analyses is in the first exercise, we focus on many different national means. In the second exercise, we focus on the overall uh, global population weighted mean of the HDI. And the, uh, the inequality uh, or the Gini uh, measure looks a little bit different taking this into account, but effectively it's, uh, it's the same. Now, let me quickly come to give you a, uh, well, I, I try to give you a sense of what the database is, is, is looking like and how it is constructed. I cannot go into full detail, um, but it's well documented which is one of the nice things um, uh, in this paper here. Um, and it's fully, it's freely available online. Um, and there are various updates. It's the, it's the Global Data Lab um, is hosting this, uh, this data set. And of course, I mean, it's not the case that suddenly all statistical offices decided to collect uh, harmonized information. So, which would be nice. But um, what we have, to, what is done in this data set is that different data set, uh, sources are combined, which includes the statistical offices, including Eurostat in the case of the Euro European Union. But then there is also the area database and the global data lab, that, which is already harmonizing um, a huge amount of available data sets based on censuses and demographic service. In particular, the DHS data set is a key source for the area database, but also for the subnational HDI in the end. Um, this subnational HDI database is also relying on the official HDI database provided by UNDP um, for the national level uh, values uh, of the country. Then, in principle, 
there are, I mean, there, there are um, limitations in terms of comparability, uh, depending on, but this is again documented. So you don't have all the information for all the countries always in the same way. So in some cases, so first, sorry, education. I mean, yeah, we have education, health and standard, uh, living standard, which are the usual components of the HDI. Education is measured with, uh, as usual, with mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling. So the latter measure is a bit more prospective um, in terms of the educational outcomes. But then other measures are not available in all forms across all countries. So life expectancy is the preferred measure, but sometimes only child mortality is available. So they sometimes they, the data set exploits both or only one of them. But I think the key question you are um, you might be interested in uh, because the uh, the third component of the uh, HDI, um, uh, the version of the GDP GNP, is um, has been or is known to be not really reliable on the subnational level across the world. There were many problems. I mean, there were attempts to come up with a subnational, subnationally comparable and reliable income dimension, um, but there were many limitations. And the way the, the, this, this data set tries to close this is by relying on an international wealth index, um, which is like filling the gap of. Uh, of the, um, the resource-based dimension, if you want. Um, so how is the HDI computed? Well, it was revised at some point. Uh, so it's by now it's the, um, the, the cubic uh, root of the three dimensions. And that would be the HDI on, uh, for region I in country M. Uh, then what the database also does is it ensures that the population weighted uh, subnational human development index equals the, um, the national HDI uh, in a particular year. And then again, I have to, re uh, I want to flag that uh, for some countries we have data since 1990, for others only post 2000. I will, most of the analysis will cover the entire range, but when it comes to the global analysis, uh, um, please keep in mind that there might be, uh, um, we're trying to flag them, that there might be um, aspect uh, like um, years which one should compare with more care uh, or more carefully. Um, then a, a usual issue that we observe is that uh, this is based on micro data. So DHS is covered every five or so years, depends on the country. Um, so, and what this database also does is uh, it applies inter and extrapolation techniques for survey years. At some point we were analyzing whether that makes a difference or not to many of the measures, uh, to our an analysis. But uh, unless you move very far away from, uh, in terms of extrapolation, uh, there, was, uh, there were no differences to, um, to detect. Now, how does the data look like? And this is the first view on the, on the bare or the very simple uh, entire distribution of subnational uh, HDIs over time. We see, we see three, uh, three distributions. One, the red one, 1990, the green, 2000, and the bluish one, uh, 2018. Um, so this is shifting over time, as we can observe. The mean is increasing. You see also the means over here explicitly. And then we also see the standard deviation, which is actually decreasing. So based on that criterion, we would observe uh, uh, convergence. Uh, well, we can estimate, we, we should estimate more carefully, but for, for the sake of, of the argument, this is enough uh, here. Um, to keep, uh, then you see um, that in 2000, several rather poor countries or low uh, human development countries entered the data set. And this is what you can see here on the lower tail. So you see a tiny hump. Uh, on, on the left-hand uh, side of the green, of the green uh, distribution, which are some countries which have been added only, only here. So this is the, um, uh, the first uh, sense of what is happening in terms of the entire distribution. So now let's take a look at how, what does inequality actually tell us? So how are things evolving over time? On the left graph, you see two inequality measures on the, on the global level. So the red line here is the overall, uh, the overall global uh, inequality, uh, which covers, if you're familiar with the literature, the within and the between inequality. And the axis is on the left-hand side. So uh, to be careful uh, to, to, to read the, the particular values. And we also see, we highlight here the, the break around 2000. So we have to be careful with that uh, information here. But in general, we see declining inequality. 
And the same also applies if we take a look at the global within country inequality, it's also declining. We would have to take a look at the right side of the axis here uh, to read the values. So that is, um, uh, to, uh, is uh, here we are connecting with the literature. The question is, of course, or one of the questions here is, if we see global inequality to be declining, does that really apply to every country? After all, this is population weighted. And on the right hand side, you see a figure which actually plots the within Gini inequality on the Y axis and the national level of the HDI um, on the on the X axis and by tendency. So we have path here for each country is representing a path and the circle indicates the most recent period. In general, we see for most of the countries inequality to decline in particular for those with low and medium levels of national HDIs. So this is the broad trend and the idea is can we say something more or more detailed or interesting if we take a look into the tails of the distributions more carefully? So how do we specify our measures? Uh, first, uh, we, uh, this is the first exercise. We focus on within country inequality. And first I will explain how we specify the measure and then what we observe empirically. So now remember it's an entirely relative poverty measure. So the interesting quantity to look at for us here is the relative performance of subnational HDI relative to national mean. Uh, because in terms of this ratio, we will formulate or choose the poverty cutoff or the underperformance cutoff uh, and overperformance cutoff. So as we expect, so sorry, uh, first this is, uh, this is a pooled data. So it's, the, it's everything we are all country here, uh, subnational, uh, region here information that we have, we pull it here and show the distribution. We see it's a relatively squeezed distribution uh, with a standard deviation of uh, 0.08 something. Um, and what we are actually interested in is uh, to, to explore what happens in the tails of the distribution. What are these tails now? Because we have pooled data, this is actually historically far uh, so historically rare under and over performance. So it can happen that we observe what we see here in the tails only in, in very few periods. So we are adopting a kind of conservative approach if we aim to study what is uh, the development uh, in the tails. Um, we can easily, or one could easily argue to go for a more liberal or permissive cutoffs in order to see uh, to which extent that matters. So what we adopt here is um, the dashed lines here indicate the three standard deviations. So it's, it's quite a bit. Uh, so we don't try to get too close to the mean, of course, because then it doesn't become really interesting. Um, so we're interested in the, in the lower tail and three standard deviations is approximately 0.75. And we run or we analyze uh, our uh, data with an underperformance measure. The preferred choice or the conservative choice would be 0.07. And we also adopt the liberal version, more liberal version of 0.08 uh, in order to see whether that makes uh, any substantive difference. And we also apply a sim in a similar fashion, we choose the, the over performance measure cutoff, which uh, uh, the preferred conservative version is 1.3. So a region has to uh, have a, a relative performance higher than that in order to be considered overperforming in one particular country. And we choose a less demanding cutoff uh, of point, uh, 1.2. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's the, this is one way to look at the distribution of relative performance. Another way to look at the distribution is to take geographic uh, perspective, a more geographic angle on the, on the distribution. And here you see a snapshot uh, for 2010. And you have here the scale. So it's like a, a round one is very close to mean performance. And the, a dark blue would mean very highly overperforming compared to national mean. And a very dark red shows you a uh, very poor performance relative to national mean. Um, what we see here is in 2010, there are rarely any super dark blue or red colors left. So we, we find them in the early years, but no longer in the medium years. Um, there is an animated version of this, but it was a hard time to integrate that into the PDF here. So I won't show you this one, uh, but there you can see the dark colors in the, in the earlier years. And an, another interesting observation is here um, that on the one hand, we have countries which um, have on, only, for example, regions uh, lagging behind in the sense like Angola, for example, maybe you can see that 
year approximately. Of course, that is always a bit above the average and a bit below, but far below is not so common. And we observe, for example, in Angola that we have regions lagging behind, despite no country, no region being like racing ahead. Contrary to that, in Nigeria, for example, which is approximately here, we see both systematically over and underperforming countries, so polarized in some sense. Um, and then here you see uh, the over and underperforming measures in action. One has to be a bit careful with the interpretation because it's meant to be concise and not to throw too many graphs. So we have four countries, four cases. The, the, the upper one shows uh, the underperformance measures. And we have in each of the figures, we see all three measures for the alpha equal zero, one, and two. So the red line here for Senegal tells us, which is the um, kind of headcount equivalent, tells us that in 1990, uh, almost 10% uh, of the population was living in regions which are lagging behind, according to our uh, preferred cutoff, uh, in, uh, uh, relative to the national mean. And we see them to be pretty constant over time, which is in the nature of the measure. And then suddenly it, it declines sharply and remains zero. If we complement this analysis with our gap and square gap measure, we get a more nuanced view because obviously in the moment where the regions are catching up, this is already traced or tracked by, for example, the green line here tells us uh, the, the gap or shows the gap measure. And we see a more smooth, smooth transition uh, towards catching up and even more so for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the squared gap. These are, th there are several countries in the paper. You can find all of these figures here. I selected just some to show you how that could look like. Um, this is a common pattern, but not all countries have this pattern for underperformance like Senegal. If you take a look at Chad, for example, which only became available around 2000, we see here a peak around 2005, which we expect is, uh, or which we assume is related to the civil war and the military action going on in that year within the country and with neighboring countries, but later it was also catching up uh, in this sense. And then we also have, uh, if we move to the overperformance measures, uh, we have here the examples of uh, uh, Ethiopia and Senegal again. So we, we have a similar observation for Senegal, for example, the headcount is barely changing. It, it's mostly reflecting changes in population shares, but we also have the decline that we can trace uh, uh, through the gap and the squared gap measures. Uh, and a similar pattern we have for Ethiopia. However, for Ethiopia, the overperformance performing regions are not disappearing. So they are still there. And around 2010, for example, there is barely any change um, in any of the measures. So, and this is within country perspective. So there are regions that are not really catching up with national mean performance. So this is meant to give you a sense of what you can, what you, how you can use them to monitor progress and uh, examine whether there are, um, whether there are, um, patterns of issues. Yeah. One question is, this is maybe a bit, uh, uh, maybe not so, so too easy to read. Um, what, what is the, so the question is, how exactly are our measures related with inequality? So are they showing us actually the same phenomenon or um, do they show something different, distinct? And one way to, to, there are many ways to look at this. One is this one. And here we plot on the left hand. So just focus please on the left hand figure, which is for our preferred parameter choice. Uh, we have a second version on the right hand side, uh, which has more detail because we have more observations because of the more permissive cut, uh, cutoffs. Uh, and we see here the inequality on the left hand side and uh, sorry, the over under performance on the Y axis and the Gini uh, inequality measure on the X axis. And so what we see is like, on the one hand, there is a mechanical component related in here because we cannot have over underperformance without inequality. However, the other, is, other way around is well possible. But what we see is for many countries with medium high inequality, say from 0.05 to 0.1, there are many countries who have zero under overperformance, which is um, interesting to, to note. So there is not, not a mechanical way that this is uh, an implication. Uh, in addition to that, for a given value of inequality, we observe a significant variation along the over and under performance. You can see that even stronger if you look on the right hand side for a medium inequality level, like say uh, 0.055 somewhere here, you see that there is uh, a good amount of variation of what we observe. So the idea is they are related, but it's hard to infer one from the other. 
This is one way to look at this. Um, then let us, another way is to look into the contributions. And the question is how much do over and underperforming contribute to the inequality within country inequality that we observe? And here we see uh, the regional contributions to within country inequality if in 2018 on the left hand side, if that particular country has either an under or overperforming region in that particular year. And we see that by tendency, we have several countries with the green contribution, which is here the overperforming regions, and only few left with underperforming regions um, in, uh, in 2018. And we see here, for example, that the case of Ethiopia, we saw it before, we see also the contribution of the overperforming regions still here. The interesting observation here is that if under and over or if overperformance is still present, it contributes to about to about 15 to 20 percent of the inequality in in that particular country. This connects. I don't want to overemphasize, but this connects with the idea of um, um, detailed in uh, Deaton's uh, "The Great Escape," that progress makes for inequality. Uh, we can also take a more Pers more uh, the perspective over time and this is illustrated on the right hand panel of figure in the case of Senegal and we see first the overperforming regions to catch up later uh, to see uh, uh, sorry the underperforming uh, underperforming regions to catch up and later also the overperforming regions to disappear an important insight is also that much of the inequality that we see is due to less than um, ex well, uh, over and underperforming regions so then let me turn uh, to the global cohesion analysis. Here we see um, the, uh, here we see the, um, the distribution uh, of the, um, of the uh, subnational HDI relative to the global mean. This looks a bit different here, um, but again, this is the distribution uh, where we want to choose the cutoffs. So here we have again a mean of one, which is by construction, and we see it's less squeezed. So we have a standard deviation of uh, 20, 23, a point to, uh, 0.23. And if we, we have here the dashed lines again, which indicated two standard deviation, which is still quite a bit, but less than uh, for the within uh, country inequality, relative to, uh, inequality distribution, performance distribution, sorry. Um, and so the idea here is we will choose our preferred cutoff will be 0.5 in terms of underperformance and 0.15 in terms of overperformance. And again, uh, well, not, well, again, we have a second set of more permissive cutoffs. And also I should mention that it just for the ease and for the sake of the argument, we choose, um, we choose sym symmetric uh, cutoffs. I mean, we, we, one could make easily the case for deviating here. Um, so we want to see what happens, whether the, these countries stay far away of the mean or not, and to which extent that applies also for the overperforming regions. So now again, the geographic view uh, on, the, on the distribution. And uh, here is again a snapshot, this time for 2018. And we see many of the dark, so of the dark red, so underperforming on, compared to global mean, are in the northern bit of sub-Saharan Africa here, including, uh, for example, Chad. Um, what you cannot see um, in full detail, only a little bit, but the animated version of that shows quite clearly, is also a gradient from coast to hinterland, um, which is also plausible. And we, we can spot that here, for example, in Nigeria, uh, but also in other countries. Um, yeah, so maybe let's uh, move on in order to focus on the over and over, uh, underperforming measures. So here we have again four figures. The left-hand side shows us the underperformance graphs, the right-hand side, the overperformance graphs. We have above on the, in the first row, the more liberal measures or more permissive measures and the stri stricter cutoffs are below. If we focus on the upper left, we see that for, our, uh, for, for, a, uh, for a cutoff of 0.6 of, um, uh, of the, for the underperformance measures, we also see a good, or a system uh, uh, a decline throughout uh, the last 20 years. Uh, the interesting thing is once we move to the stricter version, so who, which so um, for a uh, for a cutoff of uh, 0.5, then we uh, actually see there is improvements in terms of the uh, in terms of the headcount version. So the simple proportions of people living 
in underperforming regions. But this comes to a halt around 2010. I mean, there are some fluctuations here around, but essentially there is no improvement. Now, we know already that uh, this measure wouldn't be able to spot by construction whether or not the regions are uh, catching up uh, uh, or closing the gap. But this is what the, the gap and the squared gap measure, so the green and the bluish line would tell us. But we, here we see also that these regions are essentially not catching up. So this progress here came to a halt. This looks, it looks more optimistic in the, in the, upper, uh, in the upper graph because we still, we, we see a strong decline here, but also the, the decline is slowing down uh, towards the current margin. And now the nice feature here is, uh, or one of the nice features is that this headcount here, uh, it's uh, 0.0065. If we multiply that with the world population, this would tell us that approximately 48 million people are living in those regions. And it would be, to, it would go up to um, 181 million people if we take this more liberal uh, uh, cutoff here. So in the upper figure, you see. So that's one observation that is a bit uh, worrisome. And actually this can only be detected if you have both, we argue, the underperformance measure and the, the, the granular uh, or the detail, the level of detail for the subnational data. Um, if we move to the overperformance, we see independent of the cutoff choice, we see over and underperformance to disappear. So, I mean, there is the structural break around 2000, where we have new data, uh, at least, um, but the, the trend is pretty much the same. It, the, the year um, differs in which overperformance tends to disappear. Um, so this, yeah, that's the main observation here. Um, so we can also um, apply the similar exercise on the global level in terms of the contributions of over and underperformance to global inequality. And what we see here, for example, um, well, we, again, we have to be a bit careful with when around 2000, we see, for example, the, oh, sorry, the dashed lines tell us uh, the more liberal measure and the, the, the solid lines, the conservative measure, the, greens, the green are the overperformance measures and the red is the underperformance measure. So we see, for example, for the liberal overperformance measure that around 20% of the inequality observed in 1990 were actually or could be contributed to overperforming regions. But this contribution entirely vanished over the, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, things look different for the contribution of the underperforming regions, uh, which is, uh, uh, we see a decline in uh, between 2000 and 2010, but uh, we see also, which is reflecting the previous finding, that this is, um, that there is no progress on this front here. Sorry. Um, and then let me conclude um, to, to emphasize some key insights. So we believe that uh, the relative over and underperformance measures are useful to complement convergence and inequality um, uh, measures in the analysis. Uh, and we think that is for several reasons. One is it allows us to identify, this is similar to poverty measurement, identify the regions which are actually lagging behind or racing ahead. It's also useful for learning from these regions potentially. Um, then it's also the measures account for population shares, which is important from a well-being perspective. Um, because we use the family of poverty measures, we can also reflect the gaps and see whether there is, whether there, uh, there is, there is a catching up uh, taking place or not. And also these measures can be used to understand uh, the, the, the relevance for inequality, to which extent they are connected. Um, then um, in general, we observe that over underperformance is similar to inequality declining uh, in whichever way we measure that. But, um, and, and sorry, and if, if this is, uh, if overperforming regions are present, present they, they tend to contribute quite a bit, meaning 15 to 40% to inequality in the within country perspective. And the other um, large empirical finding is that some regions are left behind from a global perspective. And this is uh, not to be ignored given uh, the amount of people living there is the argument. Um, there is also like a critical re reflecting instance to the, to the, to the global, uh, uh, to the, to the HDI here involved to a global analysis, because it seems things are, um, uh, living conditions are improving throughout, but this is not meaning that we have uh, similar, uh, equally good living conditions in all countries. And this is partly of the, because of the nature of the measure 
um, it's focusing on very basic dimensions of human well-being, health education in particular, and very relatively low achievements in education, for example. So the question is, maybe it makes sense to consider to expand uh, the HDI in order to um, to better reflect the disparities that are that are obviously there. Um, so that is this is more on a reflected a reflective note. Um, and uh, as a final um, comment or like conclusion, it's like, of course, we would like to emphasize that the choice of the A's and the B's, so the parameters or the, the thresholds for over and under performance measures is pretty much uh, a normative decision. Uh, and this depends on the objective that one is pursuing with, in a particular analysis. So um, that we, we try to justify that. But it's important that uh, there might be there might be entirely different choices, way more appropriate in different exercises, and uh, this is in order in, in the end it's about obtaining useful measures, uh, and it depends on the objective. This is something we would like to emphasize, and um, then uh, uh, I'm done. So I'm looking forward to uh, comments, questions, suggestions of uh, whatever type. Okay, uh, thanks Nikolai for uh, your seminar. You were perfectly on time and uh, well, uh, you presented a lot of very interesting material. So we'll now open uh, the tool for questions. Is there any question from, from the floor? Well, I will start with one. Uh, it's more technical. Maybe I missed something, but uh, is it possible to derive the standard errors or the confidence intervals of this? Uh, in the indexes because you know otherwise yeah. it's difficult to understand whether not not or maybe yeah. by bootstrapping or something like that yeah uh, that's uh i fully agree i support that point um uh, entirely uh, there are ways to get some kind of standard error uh, the problem is uh, at the moment it's not provided by the database although i believe that should be possible for at least i mean for many countries, it should be possible. I'm not sure whether it would be possible for all of the countries, given the different data sets that have been combined. But in particular, if we're interested in, I mean, sometimes they use uh, administrative data on, or, or census data. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, to which extent that will work. But in case many of the DHS data sets, that should be definitely possible. Um, to, to, and uh, I mean, of course, I mean, this is a key information to discern, uh, to, 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 to detect whether these differences are relevant. Um, I'm trying, I'm advocating actually for this, uh, but I'm not on the data provider side. On the other hand, um, the, the, there are ways to use some kind of bootstrapping, but what we, what we cannot get is actually the sample variation. I mean, there are other ways of errors we could try to incorporate, but there is also the downside, like, of course, I mean, we could try to incorporate some error, but it could be misleading very quick, quickly that we actually try to show errors which don't capture the sampling error of the underlying samples. So they, uh, Jerun and Inyaki have this kind of approach in their paper, which I cited from 2020, but this is not reflecting the error of, um, um, of the underlying samples, which is something I would like to have actually in the data. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to, ex I'm trying to, to, to explore the options whether there is a way to get this um, sense for an error margin uh, out of the micro data sets. So even if, I think it would be even useful if we have this for some of the years to get a sense of the precision of the estimates, even if it's not comprehensive or not covering all of the countries, um, I think there would be a value added for that. Yeah, but at the moment, sorry, it's not, uh, it's not feasible. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other question? Antonio, this is Kike. I have a question, if I may. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. May? Oh, okay. yes, yes, of course. You don't have to okay. ask me. Uh, uh, okay. Thanks, Nikolai, for the nice presentation. First, this is the first thing. Uh, then uh, you say in the conclusions that uh, inequality within countries is decreasing uh, almost everywhere. So my question is if this is so as well in Europe, because if so, this is in sharp contrast with uh, uh, some evidence that suggests that within uh, country inequality, in, for instance, GDP per capita, GDP uh, productivity, etc., 
uh, has been increasing in the in the last decades. That's yeah. my my question. Yeah, makes perfect. I would agree. It's like uh, I think the the observation here is. Um, I mean, I think I was mentioning that in the when briefly uh, when we uh, in the related literature that in particular uh, the trends in terms of income inequality are not clear. So my, I mean, we didn't study this in detail, but my response is here that we have an index uh, which relies on several dimensions. Uh, we, we observe in decreases in inequality in by tendency within country inequality in education and health. Uh, so by tendency, uh, the, the, the consideration here is that they are actually overlaying the increasing or not changing uh, uh, within country inequality uh, in income. This is one aspect. The other aspect is we go to the subnational level, but we don't go to the individual level in within country. So we have not like, there is a component of within country inequality that we are not capturing because we remain on the regional level. We consider to do uh, to run uh, dim dimension specific analysis, um, but that adds um, lots. Of, I mean, some methodological questions, but also lots of evidence to digest. So, I mean, we are considering to do this. Um, we didn't do it yet, but I guess that would be like a clearer response in terms of evidence uh, regarding your point. Yeah, but then uh, based on your answer, I think there is uh, an important policy implication because this means that uh, redistribution policies, I mean, regional redistribution policies uh, should be working. I mean, should be successful. Is this, I mean, is this interpretation correct? Um, well, I mean, re re in terms of income, we, we don't know whether this kind of redistribution works, but in terms of... Uh, no, in terms of health and education yeah, and so on. This, 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 is, this is what uh, is, um, well, at least consistent. I think in order to really support that, we would have to disaggregate by dimension because otherwise it can be that these are set off, no? I mean, but it makes make sense maybe to look in that for, for a policy recommendation. Maybe it's, I think it's a good point to, to connect. Okay, thanks. So there are a couple of questions uh, by Vicente Royuela. Uh, Vicente, please. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for your presentation, Nikolai. I, I really enjoyed it because I have worked myself also in uh, Human Development Index and inequality, etc. But with, um, with a different perspective, which is uh, inequality within regions, okay? And in general, within countries and the association that you present is something in the middle, which is great, okay? So you have these global inequality measures, this from Milanovic and other, and other authors, and also this um, uh, individual or just say within regional inequality measures, and you're something in the middle. Um, my feeling is that this spatial inequality is probably within countries, is probably the less important dimension of all, okay? But this is something um, which you, even if it's small, I mean, for me, it's great that you, do, you provide this information. So I, I, I don't want to, to say it's not important, but, but um, I think it could be nice just to see what is the importance of this spatial inequality with respect to this overall or global, etc. because I think it matters very much. And my second question has to see with, um, is related with, uh, with the previous one from Kike and with your answer in the sense that um, income inequality versus all the dimensions of development inequality can drive you to very, very different um, questions. So there is a paper in 2005 from one guy called Kenny he was asking himself, why do we care about income inequality, convergence in income inequality, if everything else that matters is converging? So um, I, th I think that this, uh, this is a very nice question and that the, the data you are using, the data you're presenting can be driving to, to, to very uh, interesting insights. So, well, um, these are comments or questions. I don't know. Just answer the way you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, thanks for the for the for the comments and questions. I, I think um, it makes sense to. Uh, I mean, for now we are not going into detail how this. Uh, level of inequality that we are uh, measuring is connected to uh, to to others a little bit yes um, but uh, I agree that it's like the in kind of intermediate uh, level and um, of course it is um, an important piece in the middle the question is to which extent I mean it could be that it's the least important but uh, um, the question would be to 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 document that more carefully I think you see a little bit in one of the figures it is, uh, one could see that the within country quality is uh, on a different level compared to the between country inequality, which is, uh, but it depends also on the focus, no? I mean, uh, if we think in, in terms of the within country exercise, um, so that can be kind of useful anyway to complement. Um, I came across the Kenny paper, and actually it's um, on the list to integrate uh, because I think, I mean, what we're, what we're trying to argue here is convergent matters, uh, but we may not capture everything we would like to capture from a policy perspective. Uh, so we might capture a great deal, um, but in particular those which are potentially left behind, that is ignored. And uh, so in this sense, um, um, we think that there, that there is an interesting contribution on, on, on that side. Um, so, but we, we, we're gonna, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna integrate that one. Um, yeah, I think I, maybe there are more comments or questions before we just curiosity. Um, I, I don't know. So is there any other uh, question? Uh, it seems uh, there are no other questions from the floor. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, we, we can, uh, you can continue talking with Vicente, uh, who for sure we contribute a lot to this discussion. Uh, or, well, we can stop here for, uh, for uh, today's seminar. And uh, thanks once again for, uh, for, um, for your willingness to present even in this uh, uh, strange format. I, I hope next year we will be able to uh, go back to real uh, seminars uh, in person, uh, but still we enjoyed a lot your presentation and thanks again. So we will uh, share this, please send me the link and I will share it with our research officer to be posted in our uh, YouTube channel. Okay, thanks a lot and have, in, have a nice weekend. Yeah, thank you. Thank you too. A lot for the comments and the, for the opportunity to present. So I enjoyed and hopefully we meet at some point everybody in person. That will be great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Take care.